For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our Ancient History fan community, visit patreon.com slash world of antiquity. Hi, I'm David Miano, and I'm answering voicemails. Let's give one a listen. Hi, David. I have been enjoying a lot of your videos debunking all those ancient technology stories. So it would be interesting to hear your opinion on the Edfu Temple texts that people also cite as a possible source for the Atlantis myth. It's like they also have like a story about an island, some kind of war, and it ends in the catastrophe. Ah yes, the Edfu Temple texts. It's a good one. Thank you. Uh, those texts have captured the imaginations of a lot of people, and that may be because of it's the best preserved of all ancient Egyptian temples, and it has plenty of writing all over its walls. What a temple, though. Uh, there were annual dramatic performances at this temple in which the victory of the god Horus of Bedet over his foes was celebrated, along with his coronation as king of Egypt and his marriage to the goddess Hathor of Dendera. Uh, that's who the temple is dedicated to, those two gods. The construction of the temple began in 237 BCE, so it's a relatively late temple. Now, it was common for the walls of Egyptian temples to be inscribed with texts, many of which outline rituals that were practiced there. But among these texts were accounts of how the temple came to be. We don't have much of this from Egypt's dynastic period, but we do from the Greco-Roman period. And at the Temple of Edfu, because it is so well preserved, these texts are extensive. They're written in the characteristic bold characters of the Ptolemaic period. And the kings, Ptolemy VIII, IX, and X, are mentioned, as well as their queens, Cleopatra II and III. There are what are called the greater building texts, which are found on the exterior of the naus and on the inner and outer faces of the enclosure wall, and the lesser building texts, which are inside the rooms and in the halls. Now, when I say that temple inscriptions contain the story of how the temple came to be, what we find is not only uh, an exposition of facts about the historical temple, but also hints at the existence of a mythical temple on the very same spot prior to the building of the historical temple. This was to establish that the site was holy ground, consecrated long before the actual temple came to be. In such a way, the priest could say that the historical temple had its roots in the mythical age and was the work of the gods. Much of this is found at Edfu on the exterior wall of the naus and on the inner face of the enclosure wall. Other temples, though, had similar texts. A temple, you see, wasn't only thought of as a residence of the god to whom it was dedicated, but it also was thought to be the island of creation, the land that arose from the watery abyss at the very beginning. Yeah, every temple was thought of in this way, and the contradiction didn't seem to bother anybody. There are references in the Edfu text to books that may have been used as sources for what we find on the walls, such as the Sacred Book of the Temples, which may have contained traditions and beliefs about various sacred places in Egypt, and mythological books like Specification of the Mounds of the Early Primeval Age, the Sacred Book of the Early Primeval Age of Gods, and The Coming of Ray to His Mansion of Masnacht. These books no longer exist, but it seems likely that there are extracts from them on the walls. The walls don't preserve these books in their entirety, probably nowhere near that, but the parts they do preserve reveal some interesting aspects of Egyptian beliefs. Now, you should know, the texts at Edfu are very difficult to interpret for several reasons. There are references to things that we don't know what they are. There are words whose meaning is obscure, and parts of the inscription are destroyed. But yes, I too have heard the claim made that its contents include a story very similar to the Atlantis tale as found in Plato's Timaeus. For example, Graham Hancock and Robert Boval mention it in their book, The Message of the Sphinx. Temple of Horus at Edfu. Horus is the son of Osiris in the uh, traditions of the ancient Egyptians. At this Temple of Horus, there 
are whole walls covered with texts. And those texts are known as the Edfu building texts. Um, this is what they look like. And they're very mysterious. Many people, many archaeologists will tell you that there is no flood tradition in Egypt. This is absolute nonsense. They clearly have not read the Edfu building texts. Because the Edfu building texts speak of a homeland of the primeval ones. They say it was an island. They say it's where the gods lived. They say there was a great flood there, which utterly destroyed it. And that those gods who survived came to Egypt, settled in Egypt, and started to reestablish what they had had before. They built what were called primeval mounds all over Egypt, which were to be the sites of all future temples and religious structures uh, in Egypt. You see, in Plato's Timaeus, Critias tells Socrates that an old priest from Egypt says the accounts of the old times were preserved on the walls of their temples. So, if the tale of Atlantis could be found on a temple in Egypt, that would be proof that the tale originated in Egypt, not in Plato's mind. So, it's no wonder that people like Hancock have been dying to find it somewhere. When looking into this, I found that nowhere does Hancock or any other proponent of this view provide the actual words of the inscription at Edfu to show us that the writings do indeed say what they're claiming. It turns out that finding an English translation of that part of the temple is extremely difficult. And the source that I saw kept getting mentioned is a book by Eve Raymond called The Mythical Origin of the Egyptian Temple. Raymond was an Egyptologist and her work is thorough and scholarly. The book though is out of print and not available online, except in Google Books where it's only partially available and the necessary translation is not part of the preview. Amazon has the book on sale for $1,500, but I don't have that. Fortunately, I was able to obtain a copy through interlibrary loan at the college I teach at. Uh, and it turns out there is no translation of the pertinent text in this book. There's only a summary of the contents of the inscription, and this summary appears to be the source of the claims made by the Atlantis proponents. But here's what I can tell you. The Edfu records recount all the stages of the growth of the temple, going way back to how the land was believed to have been created in the first place. The earliest stuff probably comes from the sacred book of the early primeval age of the gods, which I mentioned earlier. Keep in mind that Egypt was very diverse and there were many myths of creation going around that were different and even contradicted each other. It's probably fair to say the beginning of the world was a subject of speculation for the Egyptians. Uh, there also was mixing of myths, so trying to unravel it all is a real headache and probably is impossible without more information. But for our purposes, we'll stick to what is written at Edfu. Okay, the story begins with an island in the primeval waters called the Island of the Egg, or the Island of Trampling. This is the first piece of land where creation began, and where the primeval gods resided in their mansions. There's no light at this time. They say that the ground was created by a god known as the Earth Maker, also known as the first primeval one, who existed before all other gods. The next creative act was to fertilize the land, and then the spirits, the first generation of gods, took bodily form, and the elements were created. The gods then built their abodes. These early gods are never individualized. They remain nameless and are always spoken of in a group. They're called the most aged ones and the first generation of Mesenti. Who Mesenti is, we don't know. They live at a time before the well-known gods of Egypt, the Neturu, come into existence. So those gods aren't there yet. Osiris, Horus, Allos, not there. The first generation of gods is succeeded by another generation, still not the gods we know, called the Kaz. They assume power to create the rest of the world. Then the lotus is created, from which radiance emerges. That's the sun. 
also mentioned as the original Jed Pillar that arises from a field of reeds and upon which is the resting place of the original Falcon God. The implication is that this is the site of the present temple, the Temple of Edfu. The fate of this original island is apparently what drew the attention of Hancock and Beauval. It's the time when the island apparently got its name Island of Trampling. There's some kind of conflict that occurs involving a snake god, but the texts are very unclear about that. It appears to have brought the original domain of the gods to an end. Dr. Raymond writes this, the primeval water might have submerged the island as a consequence of a fight, and the island became the tomb of the original divine inhabitants. Her reason for this interpretation is that the following generation of gods, the Sheptiu, Wa and A, are said to have seen the reeds of the island sticking out of the water. It's not explicitly stated in the text that there was a flood. In fact, it's not explicitly stated that the original island is destroyed, but it's implied. She speculates a storm was part of the story. The Sheptiu seem to have revived the island, by the way, and the Natru gods will appear subsequently. Hancock and Boval jumped on this. And although there was no explicit mention of a flood that was good enough for them, hey, an Egyptologist surmised the story may have included the flooding of an island. Snap! It's just like the Atlantis story. Except that it isn't at all. Okay? The bar is very low indeed if all you need to corroborate the Atlantis story in Plato's Timaeus is a myth with a possible allusion to a flood in an entirely different context. This is at the beginning of the world before humans were created, and it isn't located where the Timaeus says Atlantis was located. This is at Edfu. And think about this. If we surmise that this Egyptian tale was somehow the inspiration for the story of Atlantis in Plato, then we would be forced to admit that Plato fabricated most of his story since most of his story doesn't match the Egyptian one. So, to answer your question, a connection between the Atlantis story and this Egyptian myth is highly improbable. Atlantis proponents are grasping at straws here. Next time someone brings this up, just ask them to show you the part of the inscription that says what they claim. They won't be able to. If anyone else would like to leave me a question on my voicemail, you are free to do so at speakpipe.com slash David Miano. Again, I can't guarantee that I'm going to answer every single voicemail I receive. It all depends on, well, the quantity that I get and what you ask about. If a question is about prehistoric times or about medieval times, I'm not as likely to answer it. Ancient history questions are ideal. And how interesting I think the general audience will find it is important too. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.